Hey, aloha and mahalo for joining us for yet another Late Nights with Hawaiian Mike. I'm Michael Kia Nui Nui Goodrich, but my friends call me Hawaiian Mike. I've asked Mike Kumu Kaoha Lee to come back into studio and do a part two on the last discussion that we had about protecting Shark God Caves. And we're mainly we were talking about the rail transit system. But I wanted to expand that conversation and how it affects uh, development projects um, from Eva to Kaka'ako. Mike, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you, Michael. Um, one of the things that uh, I was surprised to hear, because it's the first time I'm hearing about it, but your uh, case about the Eva Marina uh, looks like the Supreme Court made a decision and it wasn't necessarily in your favor, but there are some positive outcomes. Yes. Um, as we've been talking for a couple of years now about my case um, against Haseko Eva Inc. and the shrinkage of the marina, and um, it's been four years actually being uh, taken to court in the process of um, a contested case hearing right up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in January upheld the Intermediate Court of Appeals rulings, ruling on the side of Haseko because they said I couldn't make the leap about the shrinkage of the marina affecting my family's burials in the entrance channel, that it was dealing with the shrinkage. And what was really interesting is when this happened, Haseko Eva Inc. has contracted a multi-million dollar publicist firm that takes care of all their news for the media. And of course, this is the first time your audience or anybody is hearing about this. And this happened, the Supreme Court made their, their decision uh, in January of 2015, and here, March 23rd, 2015, three months later, it has not been publicized in the Star Advertiser, or Hawaii Business News, or KITV, or Civil Beat. You gotta ask yourself, why? This was a major battle with Haseko and a cultural practitioner, I was my own attorney, pro se, and you would think they would want to shout it from the rooftops. Mm -hmm. But the way I look at it is the, the last shoe has not dropped because in their uh, supplemental EIS dealing with the whole Huakalei Marina plan and going through the entrance channel, we submitted 28 pages of a brief that if they go ahead, this is what we'll do to sue them on each point. This is not a shrinkage, this is dealing directly with going through the channel with my family, Ivi Kupuna, which a protective recommendation was given in 2010, April 14th, by the Oahu Island Burial Council. So, in lieu of doing test pit drillings to prove that they're there, and you never want to disturb your family, Ivi, so not wanting to disturb my family, Evie, and protect them, I went to court. And that took a long time. Now that the Supreme Court has ruled and it can't go anywhere in state court, and this is a state situation, not a federal, doesn't deal with federal lands, monies, or anything. Now, with the EIS, I can sue dealing with the issue at hand with no fetters, nothing to block me. So if they want another lawsuit, which I'm prepared to go ahead as I've proven I can, and all my briefs will be very similar to what came in this time around, if they want to go through that marina entrance channel and approve the EIS supplemental for Hoakalei Complex, now I can go full bore. And here's going to be another four years of legal wrangling, um, another four years of delay, because that's my constitutional right, but this time I'm not fettered by the shrinkage issue. It's going to deal directly on point. So the fact that they never publicize their win in any of the outlet medias is like they are don't want to do anything right now till either they look for another buyer to pick up the marina, as they have done with their Huacale golf course, sold it for $25 million dollars, they may be looking to get rid of this whole thing and let somebody else deal with this problem. When, when you talk about the fact that to prove that there's Ibi Kupuna in the, the, the from the, 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 the beach 
to back to to the marina. I mean, they already reinterred bones. Mm -hmm. They've already found burials, so they right. know that there there have been burials there. Yes. Uh, how how wide uh, 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 sea f uh, of coastal front um, beach are they looking to dredge up for the entry of their uh, Well, the thing marina? about to, to dredge, they have to go all the way out right, right. to the reef, which right. means <clears throat> they have to dig a channel, a deep channel, uh, for maybe a quarter of a mile out right. to the ocean. Okay. Okay. In, How wide is that? Well, according to what the specs are that they have, um, the, the channel area is at least 100 feet long. Okay. So they're going to have to shoot out all the way, a quarter of a mile, and, and either dig up or whatever, all of that reef and, and material all the way out to make it deep enough for a harbor. Um, kind of like how they did it in Hawaii Kai. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now what's, what's going to be the, 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 the result, the unintended consequence? All the sand that moves and shifts, winter, it, it shifts every three months. Is Gray's Beach right next to it is going, or Nimitz, uh, it, all that sand is going to go into that channel when it shifts because it cannot, it cannot run over it. Mm. It's going to go into, into it. it. So you dig a hole, it's going to get filled. So you're going to lose all your beaches. And you're just going to have a channel with a lot of sand in it mm. unless they dredge that sand up and it will repeat the process. So that makes absolutely no sense because we'll lose Oneola Beach, Albush Beach, Gray's Beach, and most likely everything down the coast to uh, Kalailoa Barbers Point. It'll just be a rocky. It'll just be rocky, and that's going to be the legacy of it because it'll all go into, as it pulls down and pulls back mm -hmm. seasonally, mm -hmm. it's going to end up in that big trough. And in that process, we'll also kill the, the limu and, and the, the sea life. Yeah, because. In the area. Very much like. That has happened to well reef runway when they built the reef runway that stopped the migration of the mullet that used to come into Pearl Harbor that went into the Pahau caves mm -hmm. and came out through Laie. Mm -hmm. That's all part of the Pahukaina cave system. It goes from the Shark God Cave goes uh, from Waikele all the way to Laie. That's how far it goes. And that's what we were talking about is how this is intricately connected the protecting of the shark god caves the the protecting of the limu it's all connecting in this uh, web uh, of underwater caves the honeycomb of these caves the, the, the flowing of fresh water and when they start blocking it redirecting it I mean it's it's altering the, the the ecosystem it is and the cultural landscape as well this is the land of hollow depths the land that increased the opportunity of abundance through fresh water, where the magic of life begins, is now being stopped and stymied. I had gone to the rail for years, and uh, on Cook Street, it was uh, filmed by the rail people, that I brought out the example, the first Hawaiian bank building was taken down in 1994, and when they started digging for their underground complex to put the foundations in, they found there was a Carlsbad cavern under Bishop Street where the first Hawaiian main branch is. And it took six months pouring liquid concrete down there to build a foundation. The question they never asked themselves is why was there a natural Carlsbad Caverns out there that took millions of years to create? What function did it do with our harbor and our reef system, which nobody asked? And this is going to this is going to knock people out. The, we have laws. It's called Section 6D Hawaii Revised Statutes. 6D as in dog, 1 to 13. That protects all of that. Okay, so. First the Hawaiian Bank got penalized for overstaying its lease, but the question is, what did they screw up by putting all this concrete and blocking a natural ecosystem that was there for millions of years? 
And it'll be interesting to see the, the effects of the constant water. Yeah. You know, where water is blocked up, it's going to find an easy way. You know, water goes from a high place to a low place, gravity rules. Mm -hmm. So it's going to go its own way. Now, for the marina, what they proposed, this is the Hoakale Marina for Haseko Eva Inc. in Eva. They proposed that that pond, that they pump all the water that's below and raise with, with the 17 different pumps and raise the water level. If you do that, you're going to create sinkholes because now, as the, the water starts being pushed out of the underground caverns, karsh, it's going to make the rock brittle because the water keeps it like cement together. Once you take away, it becomes brittle. And how many houses and parks are going to, and roads are going to fall in, mm -hmm. like we see in Florida all the time? Because that's a whole bunch of karsh. Those were at one time all a reef system, like all of Eva was for two ice ages created that karst system. So this, this tremendous ignorance and lack of understanding what the plumbing is of this island is going to cause tremendous problems, not to mention global warming and the rising and the melting of the polar ice caps, which we see, and the projected three feet rise in 30 years of all of that that water, 30 to 50 years that's going to come. So, you know, they're opening up the can of worms there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You've also mentioned that um, because these shark god caves uh, intersect and one runs uh, 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 east to west, that it also runs uh, where the Ho uh, Ho'opili uh, yes. project is being proposed. Okay. And people are, are very upset that they're taking some of the best agricultural uh, land possibly in the world, right? And and they're proposing to build twelve thousand homes on it, right? And of course, you know, the the whole structure people don't understand. This is not being done for transportation, because if they wanted to lick the transportation problem, you just increase the buses at a fraction of six billion dollars. You you do it for two hundred million dollars instead of six billion dollars. What this is, the real master plan of the rail system is a hub-and-spoke approach where Del Bartier, which is First Hawaiian Bank, mortgages for 50,000 homes with all of your union jobs for the masons, the contractors, the lumber, the carpenters union, the concrete, all of these things put pressure for development and is the backbone of the Democratic Party's agenda for getting reelected. Now, I have nothing against development if it's done right, like in Kaka'ako with Hughes Development Corporation, which I'm a consulting party because of the EV Kupuna, which we did talk about, the underground water system. And to the credit of um, Hughes Development Corporation, which I don't generally praise any developer, I'm usually suing them, except for Hughes Development Corporation, which is to me stress relief because they are actually bringing an Awai back from a spring that's underneath the Blaisdell that at great cost to them, they're going to bring it back up. It's a natural spring, it's not polluted, and they're going to bring it back to Kaka'ako Harbor and put the cultural landscape back as an Awai with reeds and everything and open space. And they're doing everything for the right reason. They're talking to the stakeholders, which are the people that live there, which are the people who work there, which people who do business there, how they want to see their future lifestyle be impacted by this project. And Hughes Development Corporation talked to them, got the ideas, then brought in the architects to make that dream of the community here in Hawaii like for Kaka'ako because you guys unfortunately don't sit in on these meetings, which I wish you did, is that in the waterfront of Kaka'ako, the parking will be underground and the above structure will be a park, grassy park, and only a single story structure instead of three stories blocking the beautiful ocean that we have, just a single story, get rid of the parking, the cars underneath, and paths walking through with an awai with a lot of space, and they're doing a building structure so that it doesn't spread out but go up so we we capture our historical landscape the way it used to be so the livable living in Hawaii goes up not at the expense to the land or the natural or Hawaiian cultural resources 
So there is a way to incorporate traditional Hawaiian practices into development. Yes. And and if they look at these opportunities, these these challenges, it, they have the technology, they have the expertise, they have the engineers that can do it. Right. It's just whether or not they choose to do it or they feel that it's important enough. Well, you know, it's really strange you mentioned this to me, Michael, that if you look at all the development that is taking place in EVA and everything, it looks like California. Mm -hmm. Why are we trying to remake Ka uh, Hawaii into California and Hawaii doesn't stay Hawaii? For People come to Hawaii for Hawaii, not to come here to be in California. And yet, the mentality has, for the last 40 years, is to change Hawaii into Fiesta Santerra, to um, Tuscany too, or all of these things that have nothing to do with Hawaii, with just Hawaiian place names on it, and rows of rows of houses that you can see in California with no cultural landscapes. You know, we've got all of these red shrimp, these opai ula, that are out there, they don't incorporate any of that. The, the historic parks and estuaries, they don't incorporate any of that. They just scorch earth, and I'm talking about Haseko Eva Inc., which is to me on the worst side of not caring about it, passing out money, and thinking that they can buy their way to recreate Hawaii, which Haseko in Japan would never do that in their cultural landscape. It would be like, uh, putting a telescope on Mount Fuji. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be abhorrent. Yet it happens without our approval all the time by a fake state that doesn't own any of this land. It's time for people to stand up and to make a difference. You make a difference. I am a, just one person who cares. And it can make a difference, as you can see. One person can make a difference. But if we had 10 people doing the same thing, a hundred people doing the same thing. Think of what good that can come out if you make a difference by caring because it all matters. When everybody gets to the point and says, ah, it's so corrupt, it's all payoffs, nothing will change, you allow the destruction and the desolation of our future. But if you come in... Sounds like we're living in Russia. Yeah. You know, if you come in and you do the research and you put it on the table and give them what they're asking and follow what the programmatic agreements and force them to uh, do the stipulations like for the rail stip 9B or stip 12B, you're going to get things done. But you got to read the documents. You, you, you have to do we, that. We have been getting some calls mm -hmm. and we, we, we do hear and see some young people getting involved telling us that they've come uh, up upon their uh, allodial title and royal patents mm -hmm. and land, mm -hmm. that they're asserting themselves, Good. that they're um, looking to get access to, to fish ponds, yes. and, and um, there's the interest of, of uh, uh, reclaiming or rebuilding fish ponds on Molokai. Uh, I mean, there, there are some uh, movement, uh, so it is happening. Right. People are getting educated. Right. Um, one of the cases that we had uh, talked about, uh, we're looking to uh, actually have a member of the family come on the show and, and explain more about how their family uh, got back their rights to their land and their water rights. And, you know, we're very excited about that because, you know, this is one of the few ways that we can protect our cultural practices, our landscape, and our future. We, we need to be more than um, a hearing or a, a visitation at the Bishop Museum where people say, Mommy, where are the Hawaiians? You know, as if it's the last of the Mohegans mm -hmm. or we were once was and we don't exist. Mm -hmm. Is our Hawaiian cultural value sets and our norms and our practices must continue as they evolve and are dynamic. They're not static. They never have. They evolve. Right. And even with the landscape changing, that does not take away from the integrity of cultural value sets like Pu'u Honua, which is reset, you know, in forgiveness, or Laulima, or Kokua, or Malama, all of these things that are part of taking care of the land in our Ahupua. No one else in the world has an Ahupua system, from the mountain to the sea land division. 
um, to increase abundance without collapsing the center by following nature's natural protective mechanisms and not being ignorant to how the model and system of nature work. I really look forward to the day where I can visit a, a fully complete functioning Ahupua and choose whether or not I want to live there and, and function in, in my traditions and and you know and be able to you know just bask in the glory of, of our ancestors of, of how they did things. Uh, recently I was talking to a family out in Haula and I just asked them, I said, how are there streams out here? They said, yeah. I said, are there swimming holes? I mean, they said, you know, most of the streams out here are just trickling. You know, and I just think it's so sad because the the land is is being stifled, is being strangled um, by by developers who are wasting resources. I mean, I can understand using resources, but when you're wasting resources at everyone else's cost and the cost of our future, that's that's uh, criminal. When I bring up the water situation and I bring up that one golf course takes a million gallons and if you have 20 or 40, just one golf course that's three, 365 million gallons a year for one golf course and then people will say, oh but it's reclaimed water. Excuse me, you're on an island that has a limited amount of water to begin with. Reclaim, look at California. All their surface water is disappearing and if they just go with the underground aquifer, once that's gone, they're finished. Uh, if you think desalinization is practical, look at Saudi Arabia. They've got all the oil reserves in the world and it is so expensive to heat, you know, to, to heat water, to evaporate the water and then the salt, the brine that is left over is so expensive to get that kind of heat because for a swimming pool you'll get maybe about a couple of gallons of water. And it's like incredible and it doesn't taste that great either and then what do you do with the brine the leftover that you just don't dump it in the sea because that's going to have unintended consequences as well it's going to change the environment so uh you know why are we have state sprinklers all over the place uh watering california grass when we could have peely grass there which over millions of years was designed to take dry and it looks dry and you don't have to cut it and the roots when it rains, it allows the water to percolate, not like invasive brought in grasses, which are like concrete, and all the water rushes off into the drain, into the ocean, doesn't percolate back into the aquifer. Makes no sense, but they don't understand that, that functionary of it. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, strategies I know of dealing with the water kotahikis, of getting ancient water in the ocean miles out I wouldn't put it on the table because these people would sell it like Fiji water. Mm -hmm. It's so valuable to us that like Ayamahea uh, Kavai Akane, where are the waters of Kane, that, that just wasteful, wasteful um, for the, um, the harbor at Ihilani out there. They were told not to dig over there because there's an opening and they dug and for two years fresh water spilled into the ocean. Talk about a waste. The trillions of gallons on an island in the middle of the ocean, which is a saltwater desert, to treat it or to say, oh, that's reclaimed water. It's like, excuse me, you're pumping all of that from an irreplaceable aquifer and when the salt water mixture gets to a point where it mixes, you don't get it again for millions of years. And now try to live on this island with all those concrete structures without fresh water. So, you know, the lack of taking the time to know your environment is going to turn this place into a desert mm -hmm. if strategic planning is not done now. I, I unfortunately can, can see that. And when I, when I go out into the ocean and I look back, uh, Waikiki, Kaka'ako, downtown, all connect, I wonder if someday it will be all high rises going all the way through Salt Lake, Pearl City, um, 
right out to Eva. All, right, all the way out to the end of the rail. Right. And, and in, in a way, that's kind of their master plan. That is, and that's why I say it has, the rail has nothing to do, it's TODs where they mm -hmm. set up these areas for development, and it's the hub and spoke approach. If you, don't, if you think of a liar, and I'm not telling you the truth, look at China. That's exactly what they do. All their airports have a rail system that go out to man-made development complexes that deal with the banking industry, that deal with all of the building materials that need to be done, which is big bucks money of people who come, don't live here, and leave. And we have to pay the price, literally the billions of dollars for this. And the traffic, which you, do you know how many cars are running in the rail and how many houses they're putting up there? It's not enough to cover it. Even if they had it running like rail after rail, that's not going to cover the amount of people they're putting in there. And do you think people who love their cars are going to get out of their cars and ride the rail? No, they expect other people to ride the rails and they're not going to give up their cars. That is the mentality always been in the United States and by the way, when I hear the H1, H2 theory about H3, uh, the 30 years and how great it is, it's like people wake up. All the interlaying highways that were built were not constructed for human beings to move. It was for the ICBM, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, to be put on transport systems and taken from base to base to move. So as a target, they would not be uh, susceptible to incoming uh, nukes and things to hit them. That's the reason why the international uh, freeway system was set up, was to move the nukes back and forth. It wasn't for comfort of people and transportation and commerce. It just happened to work out that that, that was a side effect. But get it right. A lot of these things that were put in were not put in for people. They were put in for nuclear ballistic missiles and their security for the United States, which is supposed to be number one before anything else. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to get food security on an island and water security at the rate we're going now. The, the water department for the city and county is mandated just to give water. And not to say no, they're going to go to desal by, by 2030 out in EVA, that's not a good deal. Doesn't sound like a good deal to me. And the people on the neighbor islands, uh, they're now proposing that uh, you pay for the real uh, transit tax, uh, so it goes statewide. So. so you better get in on it and have a voice. And, and that's something that we need more of, and we do appreciate your calls and your interests and your kokua and malama and these uh, instances and thank you Mike for continuing to uh, keep up the good fight and also give us some hope and and show us some shining examples we really appreciate that Mahalo. I'm Michael Kea Nui Nui Goodrich but my friends know me as Hawaiian Mike Ahuyo Malamapun and we're at the brink now where we can stand up in front of the entire world and we can say shame on you America Shame for what you have done to a small group of peace-loving people in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Take my car and try to take my name But the blood that flows through these veins will always be the same